Hello, I'm Doug Musio. This is City Talk. Attempted rapes downgraded to misdemeanors? Attempted robberies recorded as lost property? Quotas, stop and frisk, Comstat, faulty data, Twain's lies, damn lies, and statistics? Here to talk about NYPD policy, police statistics, and lies and damn lies are Eli Silverman and Graham Raymond. Eli is Professor Emeritus at CUNY's John Jay College of Criminal Justice. He's the author of NYPD Battles Crime, Innovative Strategies in Policing, the first in-depth study of the transformation of the NYPD, and he's also published numerous studies of management innovations in policing. He and John Eterno of Malloy College are currently writing a book, Comstat Unveiled the Naked Truth, which includes the results of a survey that created quite a stir last winter. Graham Raymond is the staff writer for The Village Voice. He has written about diverse subjects such as Brazilian diamond smuggling, the city's jail, elite youth basketball, and most recently a five-part series about the NYPD. He was previously a reporter for Newsday, where he covered a range of beats and subject matter. Welcome, Eli. Welcome, Graham. Thank you. You two guys are certainly troublemakers. I mean, your articles, your blog, your studies, I mean, you must not be very popular in the city administration or down at One Police Plaza. I mean, what's been the reaction to your stuff? Well, <clears throat> I, don't, I don't think I'm on Paul Brown's Christmas list. No, I would think not. Does he ever return your phone calls? Uh, no, no, not really, or emails. Uh, but what's, what's the strategy? I mean, I, they, I they, they figure they ignore you, you go away? I don't know what the strategy is. I mean, you know, all I was trying to do is sort of reach behind the curtain or pull the curtain back a little bit to, to give people a sense of what it's like to work in a modern-day NYPD precinct and what the, what the stresses are, what the pressures are, uh, and how it really works, how the sausage is made, in essence. And, uh, and um, there were some a lot of interesting spinoff things from that. But I don't know what his strategy is. I don't well, I mean, you've got five-part series. You've got numerous blogs, postings, and other articles. They're trying to ignore you. Have they been successful? I mean, has this reporting led to significant changes, and where? It depends on how you define it. Uh, the uh, precinct commander has been transferred. Uh, five, he and five officers from the precinct have been charged with manipulating crime statistics which I think is a very narrow viewing of what was going on there. Okay. I think they I minimized, agree. they probably could have done more, but I think they minimized it. Um, there was a lot of conversation in the community about this stuff. I th the uh, Kelly's relationship with the clergy in Brooklyn was very, was very strained, and I've, in the last uh, two months, he's actually done things publicly for the first time in my memory to try to repair that relationship. Okay. He, Eli, go. you were quoted in one of Graham's pieces as talking about this tape scandal as a giant oil spill. Yeah. Describe the meaning of the metaphor. The meaning of the metaphor is BP, for example, said the oil spill was limited to a specific area. That's the uh, line also of the police department. That. Uh, Graham's revelations of uh, Adrian Skoll, uh, Skullcraft's tapes of the 81st precinct is simply an isolated. That's one of their strategies. Their strategies is to negate anything that diminishes their story, their narrative. And their narrative is essentially that they're perfect and that everything they've done is worked perfectly and, it's and it restored stability and calm to the whole New York City. And anything that detracts from that narrative has to be A, ignored, or B, condemned, or B, trivialized. So what Graham talked about, the, the reaction, 
of Moriello, as far as I'm concerned. Who is the CEO of the Who is the commanding officer of that precinct, as far as I'm concerned, and my colleague John Eterno, who we've worked closely together with, he simply was a scapegoat. Because what they say is, well, there's a little rotten notion in, in the apple. The reality is that all this emanates from the top. And whether it's Moriel or someone else, they feel the pressure to make these crime stats go down. And that is enforced in these ComStat meetings. So the pressure is so strong. And Schoolcraft, and he's not the only one. Other tapes have come up, Palenko. Uh, there have been numerous officers who have, who have come out and spoken to me, and I'm sure to Graham. And in fact, I even say to them, why don't you uh, register your complaint on Schoolcraft's uh, blog that his, his uh, lawyers uh, uh, instituted? And they tell me, we're afraid. They might. I said, it's anonymous. They say, we're afraid. They may be able to track us down. There is a reign of terror here because this oil spill is so big. And the real shame of the whole story is that this oil spill is next to a giant iceberg. And the only thing that's being revealed about this iceberg are, fortunately, Graham's reports and a few others. But there's a giant earth, earth uh, iceberg below that that's not being revealed. And so the press, my complaint with the press is there's a story that's not being told. And the New York Police Department will do anything it can to negate any story and to condemn, like we were, we've been repeatedly condemned, because we say, well, we have a report from NYU that contradicts Eterno and Silverman. Well, the reality is that was commissioned by the police department. That report says that was based on interviews with senior commanders, and they did not, and, they, and we can't independent, we didn't independently audit the integrity of these statistics. And we have come up with two studies that have been reviewed by peers, our peers in the academic community. So we feel that all reports are not equal. Okay, now, so you've got your damning tapes and series of news stories and blogs. You've got the survey that you released in February that created this huge reaction. It seems as if that, that that has become the dominant narrative, that there's no discussion here. It's like it's off the table. Why? What is it about the NYPD or Ray Kelly or Mike Bloomberg that, that leads to this, you know, conspiracy of silence as you describe it? Well, let's just put it just a little, a little bit of context. Go ahead. Uh, Adrian Schoolcraft is a police officer in the 81st Precinct. He secretly, at some personal risk, he secretly wore a, ta a tape recorder on the job, a little digital tape recorder in his pocket, for over a year and a half. And he gave me, he gave me access to those tapes. Um, I only use the roll call tapes because the roll call is a meeting every morning. Right. I only use those because those are, are uh, a static, measurable, sort of day-to-day -day piece of documentation. The other stuff is just sort of street noise and chatter and stuff that you're not really sure what the context is. Right. But the roll calls are very clear. Okay. So to answer your question, I, I think it's clearly Ray Kelly is a, is a highly respected person in, 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 this, in city government, and he's probably very he's popular. Very popular. He's almost, well. the, he might be by now the longest serving police commissioner in history or close to it. And since it's the being the police commissioner is such a political position, you know that's 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 a significant fact. I mean, almost what is it? Almost eight years now, or almost nine mm -hmm. years. So, uh, and I think anti-terror is a is a is a major focus, and he's done a lot with his anti-terror programs, or tried to create a perception that he's done a lot. Yeah, I mean, let me, so let me just, let's just is, like, these are all ahead. powerful forces. Okay, you know, and. Uh, the other thing is that that maybe there's a lack of understanding of what, how this this kind of stuff, this, this the the downgrading of crimes and the uh, quota system affects the public. Go ahead. And the, the quotas affect the public in in that people who normally would have gotten a warning, let's say, for take going a little going rolling through a stop sign or something like that will now get a ticket, particularly at the end of the month when the officers need the tickets. So that's $115, which is a lot of money, 
at least $115, which is a lot of money for mm -hmm. a regular person who has a regular salary, right. you know. And uh, so that's one part of it. And the second, on the downgrading of the crimes, what's happening is you're, is someone has been victimized in, but in, in a crime and then they're being victimized again by having the cops question over and over again, oh, did that, you know, did that really happen? Are you sure you want to do this? And they're, so they're creating a sort of uh, devils in the details sequence where you're, you're just trying to report a crime, but suddenly now your integrity is under question. You're, you're, you're being called back repeatedly by people at the precinct asking you if you really, do you really want to report this? Do you really want to, this is going to be a big pain if you do it. Um, so th those are two real world effects of these. Explain the reasons for this imperative to reach quotas and to downgrade stats. The, for a long time, <clears throat> the city has made the argument that we can drive down crime and has built a story, a success story. And I, I plead guilty in contributing to the uh, promulgation of that story. And I think it's been a true story. But now they're stuck in the story. And they've made the point that they, regardless of economic conditions, regardless of any socioeconomic conditions, regardless of the number of police, they said repeatedly, we can drive down crime. And they, all the figures have driven crime down. So they built a public expectation. And no commissioner, no mayor now will want to be on his or her watch to have crime go up. It, it's very interesting, in yesterday's Wall Street Journal, which talked about a spike in violent crime this year, the police department, in the beginning of the article, attributes it to natural fluctuations in crime. But for, since, for, since, since the early 1990s, they were immune to these fluctuations. So they've now created a narrative, a story, that does not tolerate anything that does that. Plus the fact, in my opinion, the media, with very few exceptions, and TV including, uh, the, Jim Hoffer's done some remarkable things on ABC, but in general, they have bought into that argument. And it's very difficult now to uncover the stuff that now shows, for example, that non-index crimes have gone up, the ones that can be down, that the receptacle of downgrading. It's, and no one's really explored in detail how that went up before 2001. Right, and, and also the New York Times in a piece that Ray Rivera and Al Baker did on the elusiveness on the de of the data on lower level crimes. I mean, clearly there are, there are lies, damn lies in statistics, and there are certain data that even are, aren't collected or they're not, not available. It's, no, they're it's, not it's, shared. It's, 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 it, it's much broader than that. Go ahead. Uh, Ray Kelly has systematically uh, move to limit areas w where public where information comes out, and it, it's from the from the non-index crime. That's just one example. Uh, you can't get the docket for the police department's trial room anymore. You can't get the uh, transfers and reassignments. You can't. You can just go down the list. And so and you limit. So you he's, limit, he's, he's, he's limit him information. You limit examination, right. and you can't find problems from the outside. Right. Exactly. You cut. You so all roads must be channeled through his most trusted aide and most trusted and valued aide, and anything that doesn't Brown. fall. Yeah, he's the chief story. Paul Brown. Right. Anything that doesn't fall in that narrative does just is ignored. And I just wanted to say one more thing about the impact, Go ahead. which is, which is something that maybe I should talk about more. Go ahead. Which is that. Uh, over the last five years, the number of stop and frisks has gone up tremendously. Talk about it. Okay, and and uh, now the department will tell you that that is a valid law enforcement tool, and that's why they do it. But the reality is that in these CompStat meetings, they're putting the, comp, the stop and frisk numbers up, and they're saying, "That's right. How how many stop and frisks did you do last month?" You know, so basically, pe people, New Yorkers, are being stopped and frisk and under highly questionable, probably unconstitutional grounds because of quotas. So you're walking home, let's say you're a CUNY student, you're walking home in bed -Stuy, right? Just walking yep. home after school, you know? And Tell me, students and tell you, me this all it's, the time. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very common experience. And suddenly, it's a, what, why are you here? What are you doing here? You know, give me your ID. And without any cause at all, they're just, 
because most cops don't really understand the stop and frisk rules because they're very complicated. So they just, just kind of the shotgun approach, mm -hmm. just stop everyone, check them. But sometimes they do this under orders from their precinct commander as the tapes, the school craft show that exactly. Morello did. That's what I'm did. trying to get to, yeah. yeah. They were quotas for stop and frisk. And, the, and on the tapes, you'll hear sergeants say, you know, just stop them. It's no big deal, you know, or, or um, stop them, question them, you know. Or my favorite one is, uh, listen, if you're over there, just, just, just stop some people to show them we're doing something out there. And when they say them, they don't mean the New Yorkers. They mean the precinct commanders and their right. supervisors. Right, right. So, so this is an so institutional believe, imperative, so not I a public safety imperative. Yes, I, yeah, I believe that the reason the stop and frisk have, have gone up so sharply is specifically because they're being ordered because they're being ordered in these Comstat meetings. Not, not because of some cr right. law, criminal justice or right. law enforcement reason. Yeah, this, well, is, it, this is tyranny of the numbers in <laughs> a sense. Right. Go ahead. It's, yeah, it's tyranny of the numbers, it's idolization of the numbers, and is a common theme. The, whether it's the stop and frisk or whether it's the downgrading of the crime, it all emanates from the top. That's why it's silly for us to trot one person out and, and, and move him, because that's not really... The, Genesis. That's not going to uh, solve the problem. Uh, so there's a common theme that uh, pushes all this. And this, there is, as Graham said, there's no, there's no transparency. You can't, you don't have transparency in a giant oil spill. There's no transparency Ooh, here. You love this metaphor. That's right, because I, I, it's muddied. It's muddied and you can't penetrate it. The only ones who are able to penetrate it are those who are given access who will be confident will come out with the right report, whether it's an institute. Right in quotes. Right, exactly, or the RAND Institute, or whoever. If we commission it, but so far, everyone has been out to lunch. The city council has not taken any initiative. The mayor clearly is defensive on this and will attack anyone who And, attack, and attacked you guys and early on. And still does. By the way, we, not only has the press attacked us, but we, uh, we had in the Daily News, our second uh, peer-reviewed article was about, uh, was we, we discussed it with a reporter. He was going to do a story on it. And the day, night before, he emailed us, and I have the email saying the editor killed it. Killed it. And that following weekend, Saturday or Sunday, the uh, Daily News did another anti-eternal Silverman uh, article. Ah, the, and so there, the plot thickens. The, the narrative, any narrative has to have heroes and villains. And it has to have those who are deserving and undeserving. And I know what category we're in. Right. And then perhaps you deserve to be. <laughs> Bob Herbert did a piece called The Shame of New York, where he talked about a study that another academic, Jeff Fagan, yes. did up at Columbia, that pointed out the, the disproportionate impact on blacks and Latinos, for example. And the fact that they're not very productive as a law enforcement tool in terms of meaningful moving up the up the ladder arrest. I mean, what is what what's the story? Well, only about six percent of the of stops. And then the numbers have increased dramatically, as you point out, from four hundred and something thousand to well, more than you, half if a you cast a wide net, there are going to be a lot of people who don't deserve to be in the net, but you'll have occasional net. That's, that's the, what's happened. The system has been perverted and turned on its head. And it's no longer a creative problem solving. It's let's go on the handy short run items and bringing in people. And if we catch a few bad guys, great. We don't care about the consequences. Okay, so we've got this situation where you've got this tyranny of the numbers, you've got this, this, this focus on, you know, improving the numbers, but at, you keep getting, going back, uh, Graham, to the communities. Clearly what you've got is, in, in certain communities, increased levels of distrust of the police, and almost it seems, and I've, I've done some work in, in communities and with the police department, that it's almost like there's an occupying army and the attitude is th they're all criminals so we can do things that we might not do in Bayside? Uh, Am I putting words in your mouth? In the 81st precinct, there's clearly a perception in part, parts of the precinct that it's an occupying army. But there's also a correspond there's the opposite view which is there, there is also a fairly strong uh, uh, sort of, thank goodness the police are here doing their jobs, otherwise 
this place would and be we, and in we big found trouble. the same exact thing. So I mean, yeah. the communities themselves have there are tensions within it, and uh, yeah. certainly the quality of life and safety is dramatically improved across neighborhoods but, in New York City. Yeah, I mean, I, but what, well, what <clears throat> one of the people I interviewed for for the series <clears throat> is sort of a fledg fledgling music producer who left left the neighborhood, graduated from college, played. Uh, Played a little bit of semi-pro basketball and, the, and came back. The neighborhood is what? Uh, Bed Stuy. Okay. Okay. And he's black. He's black. Yeah. Black. And, and uh, which you never mention, I don't think, in the story. I don't think so. Or the blog. Well, post he's, he's his something. photos in the, in the yeah. story. Well, go ahead. Anyway, the point the point is that I, I just thought what he said was good, which is that that you know, if they were a little bit more, if there was a little bit more outreach from the precinct, then they would probably get a lot more cooperation from the from the public. That, that there was there was very little sort of one to one uh, interaction between the officers and the community. The officers were were like driving by, you know, patrolling in their sort of closed world, and the, they they weren't really interacting in a positive manner. In fact, the only cop that that he could remember talking to or having any positive interaction with was Schoolcraft, because Schoolcraft actually did try to talk to. The, the people and you know small talk and mm -hmm. shoot the breeze and stuff because he was assigned to a foot post right outside of, of uh, this gentleman's mm -hmm. building so it's very hard to have that kind of interaction when you're being driven to bring in the numbers and that's what's happening you know policing any study of policing says the essential ingredient one of the things that makes a lowest level police officer so different from any other occupation is that he or she has discretion mm. a great who to arrest when to arrest what to do how to intervene there's a great deal of discretion on the lowest level of the organization but what this system now is being corrupted into is reducing that discretion and because you're now becoming an automaton and you're losing the professionalism of the police. And not only that, the police now become less effective. Why? Because you have the first mo element of the CompStat mantra is accurate and timely intelligence. If your intelligence is inaccurate, if your data is inaccurate, you're not going to solve future crimes. Okay. I had mentioned to you guys that I had done a project here at CUNY for the PD between 98 and 2001 on cultural competency. It seemed then that Safer and even Carrick were looking at communities. Well, it's immediately post Louima, but they're, they're trying to engage the police in, in the communities and the understanding of the communities. Are you suggesting that that may have changed over the last several years? No, no, I'm not. I, I'm, I, I, Kelly has, does have relationships, has done a lot to build relationships. I mean, I remember when there was a period when Safer, I think, wouldn't meet with Al Sharpton. You know, and 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 today Sharpton is completely silent on police issues, and Kelly has a decent, has my understanding is has good relationships with a lot of the prominent clergy. In, in his and his reactions to uh, yeah. com police community uh, incidents has been substantially different from the past. That's yeah. as the mayors. But, yeah, but I guess, but he's way up here. Yes, he's way up in the stratosphere over f a department with fifty thousand people, and you know. And then down down on the street level, wave wave about as far from police headquarters as you can get is where it's really happening. Every commander I know, a good commander, know that they have to have good relations with the community. The problem is the pressure that they get reinforced by the Comstat weekly meetings to come up with the numbers because that's the most tangible thing. Right. And I don't report on what discussions I had with community leader X. Regular. Or what intervention I had yes, with a street right. vendor that's and a, a not customer a number. And that's, on Worth Street, And that's example. not a number I put, uh, communicate to the so problem. So maybe we're measuring the, the wrong thing. Exactly. Yeah. We're all, we're seeing it, we're, by measuring X, we're not measuring Y. And we don't have multiple measures anymore. At one point we did. And you can't, what, what, the old saying, what we measure gets matters. Right. And this is all what we're measuring. And so if you're a commander, and you're, you got your people in the field, you know how, what the scorecard is, and you know how your career is going to go. It's not their fault. Okay. Academic wise guy, you are now the police commissioner. <laughs> what one or two things do you change immediately as your first priority? First of all, 
<clears throat> you have to say that there are many measures how we're going to uh, evaluate you. And we're going to look also at how you interact with the community and how you solve problems, and not just on root figures, not just the number of arrests. And we're not going to just go by, and we're going to be more transparent, first of all. We're going to be more transparent. We're going to invite others to look at our, our statistics, because we're no longer going to be daddy knows best. And we're going to say, this is a collaborative effort. We are not the sole determiners. We work for the public. And we're not just going to tell the public what the narrative is. We're going to open up the story and give the full story so we earn the trust. Every citizen who is turned away is that bottom of that iceberg, who is turned away from making a report, who knows their report is downgraded. Every citizen is now alienated. We talk about terrorism. If you don't have accurate information and you don't have the confidence in the public, your effort at terrorism is going to be hampered. Okay. Graham, next story. What what what's bubbling out there that you see as a reporter? Uh, well, my my last story uh, was about a, a police sergeant who who broke up a fight between ten police rookies mm -hmm. and a taxi driver, mm -hmm. who who was then injured badly enough that he couldn't drive any he couldn't really drive anymore, and uh, this this police sergeant was disciplined. And has spent the last two years tr just trying to get his disciplinary uh, case resolved. And that, in a nutshell, is what it's like to be inside that NYPD bureaucracy. Ooh. Ooh. My thanks to my guests, Eli Silverman and Graham Raymond, for being on the show. See you next week. Thank you. Hello, I'm Doug Musio. Let us know what you think about this show. You can reach us at cuny.tv. When you get there, click on the bar that says contact us and send your email, whatever it is. Thanks, no thanks, obnoxious, do it, send it.